Very good. So today I want to I want to focus on getting an integral representation for the hypergeometric um, function. So our learning goal goals for today are going to be twofold. First, we're going to try and um, complete our calculation for um, finding out uh, what the MT dagger operator looks like. And secondly, we would like to get a integral representation for the hypergeometric function, which we've seen before already now, and which I denoted previously by 2F1, which comes with some parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, and a function of some generally complex variable um, Z. Okay. Um, ultimately, I want to build toward solving a physical problem, given that this is a course in mathematical physics, um, <clears throat> advanced mathematical methods. Um, and we want to solve the um, the problem that I want to solve is going to be the um, hydrogen atom, which is a canonical problem that uh, that is as important to quantum physics as um, the harmonic oscillator is in some contexts. Okay, there's a lot to be learned from there. We would like to extract as much as this as uh, as possible. Okay, so. So given that these are our learning goals today, um, let me recall where we stopped off, or where we stopped the last time um, by just going back to the last lecture. Um, so you'll recall that what we did was um, <clears throat> we picked an ansatz for what our function u was going to be and wrote it in terms of um, the integral kernel. This is the operator we're interested in. It's the hypergeometric operator. And it looks like this, Lz is z times z minus one, second derivative operator plus some gamma minus alpha plus beta plus one, d by dz minus alpha beta. Um, and we would like to determine what the solution of the um, eigenvalue problem Lz acting on some function u uh, equal to zero is. And we said that the way we do that is to um, express u in terms of some integral kernel k of zt times some, um, some function v of t integrated over some contour. And this was a little bit like what you're familiar with um, from the theory of uh, Fourier transforms or, or Laplace transforms. So basically just an integral transform. And what we're trying to do is get an integral representation. So then we said, well, we would like to convert this differential equation Lz acting on u equals zero to another differential to another equation, which you know, hopefully is not a differential equation, but even if it is, is hopefully a simpler differential equation that we're then we're dealing with. And that would be some function mt now acting on the variable t in the integral, acting on um, sorry, with respect to the variable t in the integral, acting on the function, um, on, on the complementary function v uh, of t. And we want to choose things such that um, Lz acting on uh, k is the same as mt acting on k. And I said that the, that the choice of the integral kernel is super important for um, the problem that we're solving, for any problem that we're solving. 
Um, and we learned about some integral kernels, e to the ikx, for example, is the um, Fourier kernel, e to the minus um, xy is the, or minus xt is the Laplace kernel, et cetera. So we chose what, what I call the Euler kernel. And the Euler kernel was um, that k of zt was minus one to, uh, sorry, the Euler kernel was, um, where was this? The Euler kernel was the, there we go. The Euler kernel was k of zt equal to z minus t to some s. We plugged that in and we found that um, LK, uh, Lz acting on k was equal to mt acting on k if and only if three equations held. These three equations gave us conditions for s, that s must be minus alpha. Um, and then fixed the coefficients in our ansatz for m to be um, t times t minus one and alpha plus one minus gamma plus t times beta minus alpha minus one. Okay, so that fixed for us what mt is, but we didn't really only need mt. We also needed um, the uh, adjoint of mt. So given this mt now, Let's see what the adjoint is and um, let's see what the differential equation we have to solve is. So to find the adjoint of M, to find the adjoint of any operator, um, we basically have to integrate by parts. And so the, the statement is the following. Um, to find M T dagger, um, what we have to do, is there a question? Now, um, we have to integrate by parts. So this starts as follows. What I want to do is consider the integral of m t. Okay, Somebody is unmuted. Do you have a question or? Nikki, I think that's you. Sorry. Nick, no worries. So we, to find mt, what we need to do is consider the integral mt acting on u of t times v of t dt. Okay, I'm gonna take the, there's some, there's a bunch of these coefficients that are, that um, or a bunch of, parameters combined in a particular way um, here that is gonna be a bit of a mess to drag around. So I'm gonna define this to be A and I'm going to define this to be B just so I'm not dragging these things um, around, okay? So what did I just do? Okay, there we go. So this expression then is, this expression then is the integral over t of t times one minus t. That was the coefficient of d2 by dt squared. Um, and this acted on, this is now acting on u plus, some a plus b t, where I've defined a and b in the previous um, slide, times du by dt. And all of this multiplies v of t, okay? So what I need to do is integrate by parts and the resulting integral will be u of t m dagger acting on v of t. Okay, so that's how you find the adjoint in any uh, in a product type expression. So let's do that. If I integrate by parts, the first term here has two derivatives, this guy here. Every time I integrate by parts, I throw one derivative onto um, the prefactor, which includes v of t. Um, and it comes with the minus sign and it comes with the boundary term. So I'm gonna hold off on the boundary terms for the moment. 
okay? Because we learned that there's a condition on the boundary terms that we need to uh, satisfy as well. So I'm gonna, we'll just hold off on that. I just wanted to keep, in, keep track of the minus sign. So every integration by parts comes with the minus sign, okay? So throw the derivative across to this guy, comes with the minus sign. But then I have another derivative, which I throw to this guy as well, it comes with the second minus sign. So those two minus signs will cancel each other out in the first term. And so the first term then will look like the integral, again, with respect to t, second derivative, d2 by dt squared, now acting on t times one minus t times v. Okay. All I've done is integrate by parts twice, each one comes with the minus sign. The, the next term has one integration by parts, and so there's the minus sign, and this is the derivative of um, this a plus b times t, all of which multiplies now v. Okay, and all of this multiplies u of t um, because I've taken the action of the operator from u onto v. So what's left is just a multiplicative factor of v. And this then defines for us, that's what these three lines means, uh, this defines for us m dagger as follows. So this is u of t m, in fact, let's, let's make it clear. So this is m dagger acting on v of t times u of t, okay? So then we can read off what m dagger is. And the adjoint differential equation that we required was that m dagger acting on v equals zero. So the adjoint differential equation then is simply, um, what I get when I say m dagger acting on v of t equal to zero. So this is a statement that d2 by dt squared on t times one minus t times v minus d by dt acting on, let me explain, write out fully now what uh, A and B were. So A was alpha minus gamma plus one, plus B was uh, beta minus alpha minus one. And that multiplied T, um, the whole thing multiplied V. So I need a bracket there, and a bracket here, V, T, all of this equal to zero. So this is the equation that one has to solve. This is the adjoint equation. Now, unfortunately for us, for the hypergeometric function, the adjoint equation is not an algebraic equation. It's still a differential equation. However, you remember when we picked, when we picked um, the form for m of t, I specifically didn't include a constant piece. I had a P2 times second derivative plus P1 times first derivative, and I didn't have a P0, and we saw that we could get away with this. In fact, we got away with it because this is the structure of the adjoint um, operator, and I kind of knew that this was the structure of the adjoint operator, and so hindsight chose not to put a P0. If I had put a P0 in it and followed this route, I would have found that P0 was equal to zero um, from the constraints. So I end up with this adjoint differential equation. It doesn't look much better than the previous differential equation. However, it turns out that it actually is. And the way to realize this is to express this differential equation as a second order differential equation in, uh, in V. Um, and I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you. And I don't want you to solve the differential equation. I'm gonna give you the solution. And what I want you to do is plug the solution in. So it's a quick calculation. It's not a solve this differential equation. I want you to plug the solution in and show that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are both zero, okay? So as a calculation, and again, it's not a difficult calculation. It's meant to be a quick one. 
I would like you to do the following. Um, so by expressing the adjoint equation, as a second order ODE in V of T, um, check that a solution of this equation is that V of T is some constant times T to the alpha minus gamma times T minus one to the gamma minus beta minus one. Okay. Um, I also want you to do the following. So let's call this one. And the second part of this problem is to show that the surface term, the boundary term that we discarded in the integration by parts. Um, so fill in the gaps and show that the boundary term in the partial integration is given by Q of K and V equal to C alpha T to the alpha minus gamma minus one, T minus one to the gamma minus beta, Z minus T to the minus alpha minus one. Okay, <clears throat> so I want you to check that VFT, this VFT is a solution. And I also want you to check that this Q is the term that we neglected um, after we integrated by, uh, by parts. Uh, and I'm gonna use this in what goes forward. So you should, you should make sure that you go ahead and, and, and check this. Well, if we accept that this is a solution and this is the boundary term and that the equation we need to solve is that MT dagger um, v equals zero and q equals zero. So we are actually discarding the, the boundary term. Um, we still need to specify an integration contour. And the statement here is that different integration contours will give you different solutions. But either way, whatever contour we choose, um, we must have that this boundary term q vanishes as a result of that integration. So this gives us two options, if you think about it. Either the contour is closed, in which case there is no boundary to the closed contour, and so we don't have to worry about this Q, or the contour is open, and we arrange for Q of KV to be this to take the same value on either end. Okay. So the first case is, is very straightforward. So let's take the latter case where we choose an open contour and we'll choose K uh, Q to be the same at either end of the uh, of the open contour. So for our integration contour, um, we choose Q to have the same value
of sorry at of ends of an open contour. I'm going to come back to this point a little later when I show you how choosing different contours gives us different representations. But I want to try and get to the canonical representation, the standard representation, which is called the Euler representation for the hypergeometric functions first before we do anything, just so you can see how things work. Okay, so the, the one thing I need to make a note of here is that um, how, how the parameters, um, which are generally complex parameters, these alpha, betas, and gammas, determine the behavior of both solution V as well as, um, well, sorry, let's forget about the solution. How the, the values of the parameters determine the, the boundary term. So to that end, let's make the following note. And I'm asking you to look here at this boundary term here, okay? So notice that the following is true. One, and keeping in mind that alpha, beta, and gamma can all be um, complex. If the real part of gamma is greater than the real part of beta, then Q of K and V um, as a function of t is zero, oh, sorry, goes to zero, goes to zero as t goes to one. All right, so as t goes to one, boundary term vanishes. The second point I'd like you to note is that um, this Q of K V boundary term as T becomes very large, goes to infinity specifically. This guy goes to minus one to the minus alpha minus one times a constant alpha T alpha minus gamma plus one times t to the gamma minus t to the gamma minus beta t to the minus alpha minus one, which is minus one to the minus alpha minus one c alpha t to the minus beta. So as t goes to infinity, this boundary term goes to minus one to the minus alpha times a constant times alpha times t to the minus beta, which if the real part of beta is greater than zero as t goes to infinity, goes to zero. Okay, so that's in, uh, that it turns out is enough information in order for us to choose a curve um, to do the integration contour, okay? Remember the point here is that we want the boundary term to not give any contribution um, to this. So we wanna choose an appropriate contour in order to do the integration and noticing these things about um, um, Q of K and V, um, gives us enough information to choose uh, a curve. So we're gonna choose the curve that goes from T, uh, we're gonna choose a curve that goes from T equals one to infinity. And I'm going to assume <clears throat> um, that the real part of gamma is bigger than the real part of beta is bigger than zero. So we can now choose 
Um, a curve from T equals one to T equals infinity. And remember, we're choosing an open contour um, on the complex T plane. And the real part of gamma bigger than the real part of beta. And I want to choose both of those things to be positive numbers um, so that the following is true. So now I can write then finally my solution. Sorry, Jeff, can you quickly yeah. go back to the previous slide? I just want to write one last thing. Sure. Thank you. Tell me when you're done. I'm done, thank you. So with this, then I can finally write that U of Z, the solution to the eigenvalue problem is the integral, uh, sorry, which, you know, by our assumption, our ansatz was the integral from A to B um, of K of Z T V of T DT is the integral is some constant, which I'll call C tilde. Um, times the integral from one to infinity of t minus z to the minus alpha, t to the alpha minus gamma times t to the, sorry, times t minus one to the gamma minus beta minus one dt, okay? Um, <clears throat> once I've plugged everything in. Now, as an exercise, I would like you to show I would like you to show by expanding the t minus z to the minus alpha factor in the integral, that the prefactor, c tilde, is basically gamma, the gamma function, divided by, uh, sorry, gamma of little gamma divided by gamma of beta times gamma of gamma minus beta. If you're not watching the screen, there's a lot of capital gammas and little gammas in there, so just be careful. So capital gamma, it's the Euler gamma function of little gamma divided by the product of gamma of beta times gamma of little gamma minus beta. That's the prefactor. And then finally, we can get an expression for the solution of the hypergeometric differential equation that we started off trying to solve as the following. Finally, we can say that U of Z is gamma of little gamma divided by gamma of beta times gamma of gamma minus beta, that's my prefactor, times the integral from one to infinity of T minus Z to the minus alpha, T to the alpha minus gamma, t minus one 
to the gamma minus beta minus one dt. And if you remember um, the solution of the um, hypergeometric function, sorry, the solution of the hypergeometric equation is the hypergeometric function. So this thing is nothing but 2f1 of alpha, beta, gamma, with respect to z. And there we have it. This then is an integral representation. It's a representation of the of the um, of the hypergeometric function in terms of an integral. Now, this is the general philosophy of solving these differential equations by integral representation. Sometimes I can do the integral. Right. Sometimes I can just the integral on the left hand side can be done, and when it can be done, it will converge to the Euler gamma function. But it need not be the case that I can do the the integral. But there's enough information sitting in this integral representation that will allow me to read off the properties of this function u of z without actually doing the integral. This is really the power of um, integral representations is the ability to read off properties of the solution without solving the differential equation. In this case, the differential equation um, is uh, the, the solution of the differential equation um, is sitting in the ability to do the integral itself. Okay. Any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Good. Uh, just just uh, after you write the u of z equals integral from a to b, um, yeah. and then you talk to us about the exercise, uh, I think you said um, we must expand a term. Uh, was that the t minus z to the minus alpha term? Correct, yes. And uh, when you say expand, do you mean uh, just Taylor expanded or? Um, yes. I, okay. Oh. Okay. So that was a hint for how to carry out the exercise. Um, um, as another exercise, I want you to do the following. Make a change of variables. Um, from T to one over T and show that Um, another way of writing this function 2f1 of alpha, beta, gamma, and z is as gamma of little gamma divided by gamma of beta, gamma of gamma minus beta times the integral from zero to one of one minus t times z to the minus alpha times t to the beta minus one times one minus t to the gamma minus beta minus one. And I'm integrating with respect to t. Right. So this is this this particular expression. All I've done is start from the top integral, get a second integral representation by making a change of variables. But this is the standard representation for the hypergeometric function known as the Euler formula for the hypergeometric function. So this then is the Euler formula. for the hypergeometric function.
And when you look up standard representations, integral representations for the Euler, um, for the Euler sorry, for the hypergeometric function, this is the one that you'll typically come across. Any questions? Okay, so the, the next point before, um, before we stop, because I have an example that follows that is um, involved and I'd like, yeah, maybe we can do it. Um, yeah, okay, let's, let's do the example. Um, but there's a point I would like to make before, uh, before doing that. And I'm just gonna talk through this um, and not write anything down, um, but please pay attention, okay? Whenever somebody gives you an integral representation for, um, for some function, if that function is a, different, is a solution of a differential equation or otherwise, you should always ask your, the, the question, when is, when is the integral um, well-behaved? So for example, if the integral blows up in various places, then having this integral representation is not particularly useful. So you wanna try and make sure that you're looking at domains of the integral where the integral is well behaved. So it, it's worth asking then when, uh, for which values of z is the integral, because z here is the independent variable in the differential equation. And you can see it just features um, as a parameter um, in, in the right-hand side in the integral representation both there as well as there. That's the only place that z enters this here, but it's actually a crucial Part. It's the independent variable of the differential equation. So it's worth asking when is um, okay. When is the <clears throat> um, for which values of z is the integral um, well behaved? So the key aspect of answering this question is the observation that this factor here. Um, one minus tz to the minus alpha is where things could possibly go wrong if they're going to go wrong, okay? And where could it go wrong? Well, I haven't really told you anything about alpha. Right? I haven't said alpha is a positive integer or a negative integer or, or anything else. And so as long as I haven't done that, this function possibly has branch points. And branch points mean that it's a multivalued function. And so I have to be a little bit careful about how I treat the factor of one minus tz to the minus alpha. Um, so this function actually has two branch points. It has branch points at z equals one over t and at uh, z equals infinity, okay? So this guy has two branch points. Branch points at z1 equals one over t. That's when, um, when, the, when, the, when it disappears. And at z2 equal to infinity, okay? And the integral runs from zero, t equals zero to t equals one. z1 as t varies from, um, from So as t varies from zero to one, this z1, the branch point of that um, factor, goes from one to infinity. And so I can take a branch cut to extend from z equals one to z equals infinity, and the integral is well behaved as long as the argument of one minus z is between uh, zero and two pi. So again, so the branch points at uh, one over t and infinity imply that as t goes from uh, where am I going zero to one z one goes from Uh, let's erase this and put somewhere else. Z one okay. 
country. Um, I don't know if it's just me, but I'm not seeing. Oh, no, never mind. Sorry, I wasn't seeing You're an not? update on. The... You're not. Are you sure? Yeah, I am sorry. I um, it wasn't for a bit. Okay. You can see I just wrote the word function there, right? Yes, I can. Okay, so Z one, Z one goes from. Um, Z one goes from one. To. Infinity. Right, and this in turn implies a branch cut. So we can choose a branch cut. We can choose a branch cut um, to go from z equals one to um, z equals infinity on the complex z plane. And the integral is well behaved as long as as long as um, the argument of one minus z lies between zero and two pi. So as long as these conditions hold, as long as these conditions hold, um, this integral is, is well behaved, right? So these are the conditions on z that will give you a well behaved convergent um, integral. And again, I want to point out that a different choice of contour will result in a different solution of the differential equation. Okay, a different integral representation. Sorry for the for the uh, for the solution. And in fact, this shouldn't be surprising to you because um, because this is a second order differential equation. It's a second order linear differential equation, and so I would expect to have two linearly independent solutions in any event. Okay. And what I've, what I've done there is write down just one of them. And if you remember the solution of the hypergeometric equation that we wrote down previously, um, we really did have two independent solutions and we took the linear combination of those two independent solutions to write down the general solution to the hypergeometric equation. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I, am, I, am, I think I am going to stop here today and we'll pick it up uh, on Thursday with, um, with picking a different choice of contour to give a different representation for the solution. And in fact, we'll find that second linearly independent solution with a different um, contour. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll, I'll justify for you why I'm calling this, this function the uh, hypergeometric function by relating it to the geometric series, uh, in particular, uh, a generalization of the geometric series that you're already familiar with from high school. Um, and then I'll make some, um, some comments about uh, the relationship of the hypergeometric function to solutions of the hydrogen atom. Okay, any questions? Mm -hmm. If not, thank you very much. And I will see you guys on Thursday. Thank you so much.